So I'm going to go back to really go into patient stuff, what you need to know about treatments, when you're getting treated, how to diagnose, CAT scan. Somebody mentioned the dental. We'll br I'll bring up all of those issues that are, you know, more maybe uh, more potent and basic for all of you. Again, some of you uh, might have been through a lot of this, so it might be a little bit mundane. But for some of you, this might be relatively new. And so I think that going back to the basics is quite okay. And repetition is always good. Uh, so here we're going to start. All right. We, as you know, that people already discussed that CLL is the most common leukemia. But let's put let's put leukemia in perspective to solid tumor cancers. Okay. So leukemias in general really represent the minority of cancers. We're the underdogs. Okay. So if you put all the leukemias together, all the blood cancers together, we really only represent four to five percent of the total incidence of cancer. So when we talk about specialists. You can understand, because if you have complications of your disease or issues, or you talk about, well, I may have this autoimmune problem, or talk about, um, did you notice when I get a bug bite, it's really exaggerated? Why is that? Do other doctors know this? So this is where we talk about the fact that leukemia is uncommon. So even though CLL is the most common, it's still relatively uncommon, OK? But because the median survival of CLL compared to other cancers is relatively long, and thankfully, as you've seen yesterday with all that wonderful data, clearly the survival of CLL patients is getting longer, we're going to be faced with other issues. Um, and so, there, you know, the prevalence uh, of, of CLL patients, there's many more individuals living with CLL at any given time, even though the incidence is only about 15,000 new cases a year. Now, the median age of diagnosis is 72. I know many of you might be younger than that in the audience. Um, but just so you know that when we looked at traditional chemoimmunotherapy programs, you know, we really, really cheated the average age of patients with this disease. Because the average age is somebody in their 70s, OK? And the median time to most people's first treatment is three to four years after diagnosis. So you're talking late 70s. So a lot of the chemoimmunotherapy regimens that we've touted, like FCR and bendamustine and rituximab, were really possibly too aggressive for somebody who might be 80 and getting their first treatment. So most clinical trials that I'm, Michael Keating, Michael Halleck, myself, have run, you know, decades ago, um, like on, so, on FCR, we ran a sequential FCR memorial program that I reported many years ago, really were on patients who were 10 to 15 years younger than the average age of patients with CLL. So you have to keep that in mind when we talk about chemoimmunotherapy programs going forward. It's really, really important. Finally, in the last five to seven years, we finally dedicated clinical trials to patients with the average age of this disease. So kudos, kudos to the investigators and to some of the pharmaceutical companies to allow us to do that. So what is CLL? Okay, now obviously we belabored and, th and Susan did a great, I have to say I, I loved her talk going back about genetics. Um, so I, uh, we'll touch a little bit about that, but it's really a disorder of one of your blood cells, you know, in particular the B lymphocyte. And these, think of, remember, when you compare this again to solid tumors, you have to think of this as a systemic illness. It's the, your blood circulates all over, it's all over. So when people talk about this, they go, well, if I have breast cancer and it spreads to my bone, that's metastatic disease. You have to think of your CLLs all over. It's in your blood. Your blood goes through your organs. The lymphocytes can aggregate in the lymphatic system. That's the lymph nodes. Think of your spleen as a big lymph node. So you have to think of it. If I'm going to biopsy your toe and you have a white count of 200, I'm going to see CLL. So I need you to think of this disease very differently than you might think of lung or breast or colon cancer. Okay. Now, when we talk about SLL, because people often, when they get diagnosed or they read their pathology reports, particularly if you've had a lymph node biopsy, people often will say, well, the report might say, I have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or I have small lymphocytic lymphoma. What does that mean? It's really, when you look under the microscope, the cells are the same as CLL cells. Okay, they mark, they have the same um, markers on the outside of the lymphocytes, um, whether they're in the blood or in the lymph node. So don't get confused, because the nomenclature is the same. I do argue with my lymphoma colleagues, for those of you out there, about the difference between le leukemia and lymphoma. Okay, so if you have true SLL, you really just have lymph node-based disease. You really don't have bone marrow involvement, okay? Now, I do think the two different populations sometimes handle chemoimmunotherapy programs differently. Okay, but that's a different argument, okay? I think, I think people who have bone marrow issues sometimes have more toxicities than the true SLL patients but we've never reported that in the literature, now have we? 
Um, what are the causes of CLL? We really don't know. You know, unlike some leukemias and some cancers, predisposition people talked about yesterday to whether you've had chemotherapy for breast cancer or colon cancer, if you've had radiation treatment, think about Chernobyl, the incidence of acute leukemia and thyroid cancer went, out, went up dramatically. So we do know some, you know, there are some insight inciting agents or environmental causes that could contribute. You know, think about what Susan talked about with your genes and your DNA, that sometimes, you know, our body is really good. As Susan said, you know, our body repairs itself all the time. So we, a lot of us have mutations and, and abnormalities going on, but our body is sophisticated enough to actually repair those abnormalities. But sometimes you might have something that's inherent you might have an abnormality, and then you take another hit from something else like the environment or some other exposure, radiation treatment or chemotherapy treatment, and it tends to push yourself, your DNA, to the next level. And hence, you may develop leukemia or some other cancer. So we don't know all the particular causes of different cancers, um, but certainly we're learning about them as they evolve. Diagnosis. Now, many of you, have, we talked about all these sophisticated tests. Now, years ago, we used to routinely do bone marrow evaluations on everybody who got diagnosed with leukemia because we weren't sophisticated enough to look. We didn't have those tests off your peripheral blood um, as sophisticated. We'd look at morphology, and that came from the bone marrow. Okay, So think about your bone marrow as where you originate, where you make your good cells, but where you make these leukemia cells. Okay. Now our testing has gotten so sophisticated that if you present with, you know, most people with CLL present incidentally. So if you have an elevated white count, you're often told to come back to your physician's office because maybe you have a cold or something, you're not feeling well, and they just go, we'll just see if that's really true. Um, and then oftentimes then you're sent to a hematologist or oncologist and you have those blood tests, the, the flow cytometry. So those look at the markers on those CLL cells or on any of your cells, looking at uh, if they express certain features that are akin to one leukemia versus another leukemia versus another lymphoma. So you express certain markers that are characteristic of your cancer, okay? Um, another possible, most common way people get diagnosed is that they're picked up because they notice a lymph node. They might have had it for a really long time. They finally go to the doctor and say, what is this? You know, I've had it for a while. Or women, classic example of how women get diagnosed, they get their mammogram. They note a lymph node on your mammogram. That's the most classic presentation sometimes we see in women who get diagnosed with CLL. What are the signs or symptoms that you may experience? Most people at diagnosis with CLL are asymptomatic, okay? Again, picked up routinely, either because you find something on your physical exam or you have some routine blood work, whether it be for pre-op testing for some other surgery or something, or you go to your internist and again, they notice that your white count is elevated. So most people don't have symptoms when they first present, unlike other leukemias, very, very different. Okay, but let's talk about your blood counts. Let's go through them so you understand what they mean when you see your CBC, okay? So obviously the hallmark of this disease is that your white count might be elevated or you might have big bulky lymph nodes, okay? But if your red cell count is low, so think of the red cells as um, the gas in the car of your tank. So if you don't have enough red cells, and there's many reasons why you could be anemic, okay? So if you have, um, if you're a menstruating woman, you can, you can be anemic at that time of the month. If you have bad gastritis, you can be anemic because of that reason, because you're shedding some red cells through your GI tract. What we're really talking about in this case is being anemic because your bone marrow is infiltrated from your leukemia cells. So it's suppressing your red cell count from going out into your system. Okay, so think about it. If your red cell's low, you have, don't have as much gas, when you're climbing those flight of stairs, you're huffing and puffing. You know, it's, now you may be huffing and puffing for lots of other reasons, or you may be tired for lots of other reasons, but when you're really truly anemic, you're gonna feel it. Okay, it's not something that's intermittent. It'll be slowly progressive. You'll have a harder time with what you're doing. You'll notice it. Now, what about if your platelets are low? So the platelets are what help clotting. So if you cut yourself, you, the platelets help by stopping you from bleeding. So people who have very low platelets can be prone to bleeding. If you can bruise easily, okay? Um, some people bruise easily normally, okay? That might be a platelet dysfunction, not because the number is low. So, so don't, don't, I don't want you to confuse that. But clearly that's something we wanna prevent. So if somebody's platelets are very low, we know they might be at more risk for bleeding and we, want that to, and we don't want that to happen. Okay, now what about your neutrophils? We talk about this a lot, particularly for people who are on chemo immunotherapy programs. So when the neutrophils are low, you're more prone to infections. Most typically bacterial infections, okay? There are some other atypical infections people can get with CLL, but most, most, most common bacterial, bacterial, bacterial. So when the neutrophils are low, you'll oftentimes hear your doctor go, 
like, you know, avoid crowns or, you know, let's be very careful. If people are sick, they shouldn't be around you, that kind of thing, until your neutrophils recover. So that's what they're referring to, okay? Now, what about big, bulky lymph nodes? So having lymph nodes alone doesn't mean you necessarily need treatment. Just like having a high white count doesn't mean you necessarily need treatment, okay? So big, bulky lymph nodes that we think are infringing or making, compressing on an organ or giving you symptoms, those are the people that we're talking about that we're you know, interested in treating, okay? Just having the presence of lymph nodes alone is not a reason to treat. And what about your spleen? So I told you to think of your spleen like a big lymph node. So if the spleen gets very, very large, it can push up on your diaphragm. It can make you, um, uh, you know, think of it like as if you're being, for those of you who are women and have had children, think of it like being pregnant. You really don't have room for anything else. So you get full quickly when you eat. You can have discomfort on certain positions when you lay down. So splenomegaly, big lymph, big spleen, is another reason um, that we would treat individuals. Okay. So I kind of went through that, didn't I? So years ago, and, and hopefully uh, we'll run clinical trials that I'll actually see whether or not this is different now. Years ago, the, the whole caveat that Dr. Keating had talked about yesterday with watch and wait, we really like you guys. The watch and wait crowd is not a bad thing. I understand it's very frustrating. I, I really do. I often tell my patients who first get diagnosed that it's going to take them a year to grapple with the fact that they have a new diagnosis and, and why are they being watched and monitored rather than being treated and cured. Well, because right now we technically don't have, we can argue about allotransplant transplant and some of the new drugs, but we don't have a curative, you know, for a catch-all for everybody where we can say we have drug X, you have CLL, let's give you drug X, you're cured, you're done. We don't have that. And, believe it or not, there's a quarter of patients with CLL who never, never need to be treated. So despite all these wonderful therapies, if I don't need to give you, if I knew a priori that you're one of those that doesn't need chemo, I don't care about drug X. I don't want to give you chemo. Why do I have to give you any side effects? So if I knew that you were the quarter of the population that never needs treated for your CLL, perhaps we should be studying those cells, then you don't need treatment ever. Go beyond, have fun, go on your merry way. So it's important that I understand the frustration of watch and wait, but if we don't need to expose you to drugs that could give you potential toxicities before you need them, be happy you're in the watch and wait group. And you're giving people like us more time to find new drugs, okay? Um, old studies with the traditional chemoimmunotherapy programs that Dr. Keating and Dr. Halleck and Dr. Johnson, they all talked about, those traditional studies never showed that if we treated people earlier, we made an impact on survival. So just having a diagnosis of CLL and then giving you chlorambucil or FCR or something like that didn't necessarily change people's survival compared to the watch and wait. So that's where that comes from because those drugs weren't necessarily touted as being curative. Okay? Now in the era of the new drugs, we don't know that. We don't know if it, starting the new kinases or drugs like them Earlier, perhaps, perhaps maybe choose patients with poor prognostic markers like 17P or something else, or the unmutated. If we start that group on earlier treatment, will that change their survival ultimately? So these are new questions we're going to have to delve into in the clinical trial arena to figure out whether or not that may actually change survival. But the older drugs didn't. Okay. So uh, criteria, as I said, cytopenias, anemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, okay? And there's not a number. People always go, well, is, you know, if I, my white count is 300, do I have to get treated? No. If your other counts are fine, you don't know that your white count's 300. You don't feel that. So you don't, white count isn't, the absolute number of your white count shouldn't be a trigger for chemo. Now, if you're rapidly rising, your doctor may say, your white count's going up quite quickly, so you're, the time to your treatment may be sooner because they can use that as the tempo or a guide. But the absolute white count in and of itself should not be what's triggering treatment. That consult I get a lot. Can't, you know, that's the one consult that I love because actually I save people from chemotherapy. <laughs> My doctor wants to treat me. My white count's high. Everybody's panicked. Don't panic. Okay? So cytopenias, big bulky lymph nodes, splenomegaly, lots of symptoms. Okay, and symptoms usually go into the context with changing blood counts or growing lymph nodes. Just being tired, I work a lot of hours, I'm tired all the time. But just being tired isn't a reason. It has to be in context with the change of your disease. That makes sense. 